Hello, welcome to AT&T Threat Track for May 26, 2015. This program provides network security highlights, discussion, and countermeasures for cyber threats. Uh, today we're joined by Jim Clausing online. And Jim, hopefully your Memorial Day weekend went well. Yeah, went real well. Had a real nice bike ride on Saturday. So yeah. Good. Training for uh, training for some charity riding, perhaps. <laughs> well, this actually was my first charity ride of the of the season. Oh, good. And uh, well, welcome, Jim. And we have Matt Kaiser here. How's it going, Matt, Brian? How was your weekend? Pretty relaxing. Went to the movies, uh, visited my folks, and grilled. Uh, took some hardware apart. It's still in pieces on my desk. Yeah, there we go. Now you got to get put back together. It's easy yeah. to take it. <laughs> Maybe not. <laughs> Maybe not. Maybe it's not happening. <laughs> okay. And welcome, John. Thank you. Uh, John Hogaboom and uh, John, yeah, I guess you've been kind of working through some adventures yourself. Yeah, recently. I didn't really get much of a vacation this past <laughs> weekend, but I got a little bit in Keeping on one of the days, so that was good. good. It's uh, it's been good weather here, although getting a little bit dry, and uh, so hopefully we can wet it down a little bit. I'm Brian Rexrow, by the way, and let's get into it. Um, I guess first thing, Matt, we'll, we'd like to talk with you about, uh, I guess. Uh, uh, kind of a curious twist on exploit kits. Sure, this one was pretty fascinating in my opinion. So there's a, a noted malware researcher who goes by the name of Caffeine, and his blog is called Malware Don't Need Coffee, and it's always a good read if you want to get into the nitty gritty of exploit kits. Mm -hmm. Now he, he wrote recently about a very interesting one that doesn't seem to target the user's browser so much as it targets the small home and office routers and some webcams a attached thing to the that network. that we're seeing an awful lot. A lot of that internet <laughs> of insecure things, and this, yeah. is, this is the intersection of those two worlds. So apparently he's seen multiple versions of this code. Uh, the first one was not obfuscated, and you can tell by what, you know, just looking at the code, what it was doing, which basically forcing your browser to make requests, and it's called cross-site request forgery, where a website forces your browser to load some sort of other page um, that you didn't directly request. Now, this is just how the web works when you load a web page. It could load a whole bunch of other images and other code, uh, but this isn't specifically intended to make malicious requests. Um, so what it'll do is it'll try and figure out uh, what sort of devices you have on your home network. Mm -hmm. uh, it uses a library for WebRTC, which is kind of a neat trick, to try and figure out what the inside and outside IPs are, for mm -hmm. your LAN and your WAN, and then based on those IP ranges, figure out what it thinks is the gateway and then start bombarding it with requests to see, is this a Linksys router, is mm -hmm. this a Netgear router? And then based on that, try and reset your DNS settings so that all of your DNS requests pass through a malicious server. Mm -hmm. So the first version was pretty easy to read, had a small set of exploits. The second version actually uses a, a JavaScript crypto library to encode the malware in, in AES, uh, which is pretty neat. Mm -hmm. um, but also has a huge set of, of other requests. And it sort of fingerprints routers by different files that are in it. Because most home routers have a web interface. Mm -hmm. And you know if it has like a, you know, a specific GIF, a GIF file or you know, a certain path that's specific to it, you can tell what the device is by one of those. Wow. So it's it's a pretty well put together piece of malware in my opinion. Mm -hmm. An interesting read and a reminder that uh, for Internet of Things vulnerabilities, it doesn't always have to be an exposed external port that you're taking advantage of. Yeah. It could be something that you can trick someone's browser into attacking for you. Right. A couple things here. One is that it's interesting to see the evolution here. You know, we've seen a lot of these uh, you know, small device exploits previously. And they've been really basic scripts, you know, just like shell scripts and, and doing some really basic things. Now we're st starting to see some sophistication here. And it, did you say it had, had um, uh, it was obscuring the code as well? Yep, the second version yeah. that he saw was obscuring the code itself. I mean, the way- Obfuscating it. Obfuscating it. Yeah, the same way that you, you'd see other exploit kits be packed. Right, you know, right, right. They're right. using a, a JavaScript library for AES to do that. So they, they encrypt the entire thing and then they base 64 encode it and then it gets picked apart later. Right. So there's de definitely some some evolution here. And I guess what we've seen also before, it's generally a lot of brute force password guessing. Mm -hmm. I mean, this kind of suggests that either it's targeted password guessing or there might be other exploits that they know about specific devices that is a fingerprint and then go for specific things. It's a little bit of both, actually. Some of them are directly, like there's some, some routers have like a single config page you can request that'll give you give away the password and they'll use that in the next request. Mm -hmm. uh, some of them will just try the default passwords that are known for that version of the, the router. There's a Linksys router in here where it tries a whole, whole bunch of different default passwords. Mm -hmm. And I guess the, sort of the other point that's insinuated here is that if the device isn't, isn't secure on its own, just the fact that you're within a local network doesn't protect you. 
that is as a sort of the insider's point of view you know if if you don't have a protect just the fact that your services aren't offered to the internet on the land side or on the WAN side your land side doesn't necessarily protect you so you need to really actually have a good password and right. good protections good patching on the devices mm -hmm. and, and so, anything that can be hit through a web request can be accessed using this method right so, and then like i said not just your router i mean if you've got any sort of other internet of things like a webcam that's sitting inside your network um maybe if you've got a secondary access point that's also potentially vulnerable mm -hmm. printers network test printers storage. are a good example yeah 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 all kinds of fun devices inside your network probably that you assume are safe because you have a small trusted home network of you know you've got wpa encryption or whatever nobody can get in there but this is a someone who's roguely you know compromised via a, an indirect type of method here mhm mm so right yeah. and that's one of the reasons why you know just having it on the, on your own internal LAN has never been, you know, a real good way of protecting it. It it limits the attack surface a little bit, but the devices need to be secured on, you know, on their own, and that's always been a concern. Right. I mean, it really suggests that there need to be some sort of a set of safety guidelines for these devices that are sold for connecting to networks, and particularly if they're supposed to have, or at least insinuate, some sort of a security function that they're performing. That is, it's, uh, it, it doesn't matter what's around it if the devices themselves that you're connecting to it aren't, aren't good and secure. All right, so uh, speaking of uh, it doesn't mean anything, anything if it's not secure, I guess you have another sort of aspect that you would like to share with us, Jim, about voting. Yeah, absolutely. I, we've I don't know that we've talked about it on the show too much, but you know, people are always talking about, um, you know, put moving voting online. You know, there was a, a survey. Well, I, I came across this story maybe two weeks ago. Is the basis for what we're going to discuss today. But in the uh, in this story in the conversation, they talked about a, a survey that had been done that suggested that. 60% of respondents said they would vote online if they could. And if you just took those 18 to 35, that jumped up to 80%. You know, the young, younger folks today are more comfortable online. And, you know, if they had the ability to, to do their voting online, they would. But the, this article uh, points out that there are some real significant hurdles to that yet that we haven't completely dealt with mm -hmm. um, you know if if you can't verify end to end you know that that the vote that is recorded is what's actually cast you know that's that's gonna that's gonna result in people having less confidence in the result of the election on the other hand you know people want their votes to be anonymous so you don't want to be able to tie a particular vote to a particular person. There, there are some significant challenges yet to yet to be dealt with here. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, and one of the one of the issues is malware. I mean, you know, there are some estimates of you know anywhere from 30, 40, 50 percent of all home computers are infected if you allow people to vote from their home computer. Then you have to worry about malware potentially, uh, you know, interfering with, intercepting, changing votes. Um, you know, I, I, I kind of like the idea of online voting because, it, you know, it, it increases um, convenience. Mm -hmm. You know, the one of the issues, eligible voters should have the ability to cast their votes. Mm -hmm. And this, you would seem to, you know, to help improve that, but you know, the the crypto problems are are still pretty large. Yep. And um, so I don't I don't know if if we'll see it anytime soon. Um, if we can't, the 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 final paragraph sums it up really well. Yeah. If we can't provide um, end to end verifiability then we've got an issue and you know democracy is sufficiently important if we can't 
do it properly online, then we shouldn't be doing it online. Well, I, I just have a couple, uh, just to play devil's advocate, I tend to agree, but just uh, for the sake of argument, uh, two things sort of come to mind. One is that you can make an argument that it doesn't really matter what the rules of the game are, just so long as everybody's playing with the same rules. And I think one of the things that is sort of, uh, you know, that kind of needs to be watched for is that the rules that exist aren't necessarily biased against one organization or another. It just needs to keep it so that you're getting realistic results out of it. Hmm. Yeah, I mean, one of the other things that this article pointed out is online voting has been used in a few places around the world. Yeah. It's been used, uh, I think, eight times in Estonia. Um, Norway ran some trials for it. Mm -hmm. uh, so some provinces in Australia have, have used it. Uh, there are some places in the U.S. But, you know, like Norway used it and they've basically scrapped the, the project because they were concerned um, that while it might improve voter turnout, the issues of verifiability and cost um, didn't really didn't really seem to outweigh the potential downsides. Yep. Yeah, I, I agree. I, I generally agree we're not quite there yet. That The other aspect of this to consider is that uh, you, you could easily make an argument that existing systems aren't that verifiable either. I mean, we, we like to think that things are written down. We like to think that we verified who the people are when they come through. But in any case, like I said, I, I don't think we're quite there yet, but uh, it, it's these types of things that need to be discussed. You know, I, th I think back on PKI and the promise of PKI, I think was never realized partly because it was striving for the perfect solution, something that was much better than it really needed to be to be able to pro provide actually a value add. The point being, in the voting system, we need to make sure that we're keeping the benefits in balance with the potential drawbacks of particular things. And so perhaps uh, you provide the options and then try to encourage people to do it in person where you have a more verifiable means and then sort of limit this, this strength. I mean, we have a, the, the uh, electoral college as it is, you could put some constraints on the voting, the online voting, so that it doesn't significantly bias it if, if there was some sort of fraud. I mean, I'm just brainstorming here. I think I'm thinking of absentee, absentee voting, which is yeah. probably the closest analog I can think of yeah. to this situation where yeah, you, very you do give up your anonymity when voting. You know, yeah. you say this is me and this is my vote. Mm -hmm. If people are willing to give that up, and I'm not saying they should, but that's probably the closest you'll find because I find it hard to believe that you could do end-to-end -end traceability of this is one person, one vote, mm -hmm. and that's all they get. At the same time that you can do this is one person who voted somehow. And I think it's the, the crypto aspect that Jim talked about is interesting. If they can solve that problem, I'm all for it. Mm -hmm. But once you get to that level of crypto knowledge, um, you've got adversaries who... And that's when you said anybody it, can cheat. Yeah, it's hard I think to that's maintain you integrity have with and an, anonymity. anonymity. <laughs> I think once you get to that sort of those hard crypto puzzles, yeah. that's when everyone can cheat becomes very motivated people with really good crypto analysts can cheat. Yeah, that's a good suggestion. You know, I, I'm certainly no an expert in this topic area, but I, you know, I think there are things that really need to be thought about to sort of balance the benefits. Right. So. Uh, and on to lighter topics. <laughs> the, uh, you know, I, I came across an article, and actually there was one uh, perhaps, I don't know, about a month ago that I happened to see. This is a case where a high school student was arrested for organizing denial of service attacks against his high school. And uh, this is actually a trend that we've been seeing, so I wanted to make sure that uh, it was, uh, you know, basically brought out into the public that uh, more and more we're seeing denial of service attacks against school systems. And, and John, you actually had uh, made it, uh, an observation. Yeah, I made a quick somewhere. observation because we had been seeing this over time and uh, I did a quick just look at our uh, DNS amplification reports and in the February March time frame there was no schools listed in there but in the uh, April May time frame there right. were attacks against schools. So you know I think there might be some coordination there around when these 
online tests are being, because it's kind of towards the yeah. end of the year. That's probably when these tests will get taken. And uh, that's why the, there's the motivation there to attack so that they don't have to take the test, basically. Yeah. So in this particular case, it, it wasn't exactly clear what the motivation of the attack was, but they did point out that it happened to be during the standard achievement testing right. period. And the claim was that they caused the school system to lose the tests and the results data, and the students were required to actually redo their exams. Uh, I'm, you know, it's, it's, it's a little hard to imagine how a denial of service attack could do this. There may have been some other things, but, you know, perhaps they were able to pin the denial of service attacks. It, there was apparently an investigation. We're able to trace that back to, uh, uh, to this individual and, and subsequently arrested them. Uh, like I said, I think there was another case that I read about uh, perhaps a month or so ago in North Carolina similar kind of situation where uh, a student was arrested for perpetrating denial of, service attacks, denial of service attacks against their school system. So in any case, the, the point being here, if you are responsible for a school network or even maybe you want to check with your school system to see if they have a good plan against attacks, particularly if your student's subjected to online testing. I know uh, there have been a lot of discussions about students being sort of stressed out about tests. There's no use in prolonging that stress. Uh, in any case, uh, you know, some basic things that should be done. First of all, separate websites from other network resources. You wouldn't, you know, if the testing program is in one place, perhaps, uh, or a website that might uh, be uh, attempted to be attacked for some reason, try to separate that from other uh, critical resources that you might need for communicating or just operating the school system, for example. Um, uh, just have a mitigation strategy. You know, it could be you, you subscribe to a scrubbing service or you just black hole the attack so that it doesn't uh, have a direct impact on other things or just ride it out. I mean, that's a perfectly legitimate solution, but you need to kind of have some you know, at least some plan in place for doing that. And then uh, nextly, uh, just have a plan in terms of public relations, how you respond to the event, um, whether you're going to, you know, uh, solicit an investigation, that sort of thing. So having a plan doesn't really take very long to do. It requires some forethought, and uh, perhaps a lot of school systems haven't really put a lot of thought into it yet. I think it's uh, something that really needs to be done. And when all else fails, just have a couple of boxes and number two pencils and some Scantron forms and you'll be good to go. Yeah. Right? The old ways still work. Like we did in the we 70s. Didn't have, we, didn't have, we didn't have any <laughs> online tests. Make sure it's a number two pencil. Right. Fill in the dot all, yeah. all the way. Yeah. You're absolutely right. So Matt, let's go back to you here. And um, I guess, uh, you know, allegedly a denial of service attack wiped out data. <laughs> but the Sometimes you really want to wipe out data. And maybe, you <laughs> maybe it doesn't, <laughs> it doesn't yeah. get wiped so, out all the way. So this is interesting. Um, there was some research done um, on the the actual efficacy of Android's um, data wipe functionality. So when you when you do mm -hmm. a factory reset, um, you're supposed to be able to wipe all the data off your phone. It, mm -hmm. you, you basically assume at that point that it's blank and everything you need to worry about is gone. Um, some researchers took a look at that and found out that's not necessarily the case. Mm. Uh, now this affects versions of Android, I want to say from 2.3 to 4.2. It seems that, it, it sort of, it, it seems a bit varied between the different platforms and how, mm -hmm. how each manufacturer is, is, is either more or less susceptible to this. And I think it has to do with the flash memory in the devices. Now, when you read and write to flash, it's not the same as reading writing to a hard drive because right. there's, there's internal um, logic on a flash chip that does something called wear leveling, which basically if you're trying to write to a chip more than once, it'll sort of manage certain sectors and cells of the flash so that mm -hmm. some of it doesn't get overtaxed or over, you know, overused right. it's, it's for the health of that flash drive. Mm -hmm. um, and to, to properly wipe a flash drive, you've really got to take extra steps to subvert that logic. Um, and some manufacturers, the, the wipe is working or n is not working based on the drivers that are available. Mm -hmm. So if you tell the drive, wipe yourself, and you're not get, making the right calls, you may not actually wipe the drive. Yeah. Uh, another interesting finding is that, you know, one of the things people would recommend for this is to say, encrypt the entire drive and somehow lose the key, which is great, except that they found that the decryption key, the file itself, 
is one of the few things that doesn't get wiped when you wipe the Android <laughs> phone, which is you know a little bit terrifying. Um, <laughs> by itself, that key is encrypted yeah. and supposedly protected. But if you take that file offline and run you know a cracking against it, you can eventually recover that key and then recover the rest of everything. All right. Now, the, the best solution they suggested, and it's still not a perfect solution because of this offline attack, is to encrypt your phone mm -hmm. with a very long key phrase, as long as you can, as you can, because that'll at least give you more time against an attack like that. Right, right. Uh, but it's, again, still not perfect. There is also an interesting related paper. Uh, Ars Technica wrote up a little bit about both. And the other one is about antivirus, uh, like anti-theft mechanisms that are tied into property or mobile antivirus. Mm -hmm. And that same situation where they're not properly using the APIs shows up there as well. Yeah. So both are good reads. They're a little bit dense, but I recommend them. Yeah, interesting topic. You know, the, um, the whole notion, you know, disk drives also have hysteresis associated with them. That's why mm -hmm. they ask you to overwrite them a number of times to be able to basically wipe things out. But that's the idea of kind of reversing things and bringing it back. You know, writing to actually even just dynamic memory, dynamic uh, semiconductor memory, even though it's not intended to have any, uh, you know, fixed memory associated with it. The flash memory is actually kind of the same principle. Uh, flash memory, you're just kind of sucking in some electrons into an insulator barrier. Mm. And when they get stuck in there, that represents a one effectively. Yeah. And so when you try to suck those electrons out, I'm, I'm you know, I'm using right. my own layman's term. Yeah. It's a, but the, uh, when you pull those electrons out of there, they, not all of them necessarily come out. And so you could have some remnants of that left. I'm not exactly sure if that's what they're doing here, but that's, you know, that whole notion, you can only really kind of penetrate that oxide so many times, that, that insulator so many times. And that's one of the reasons they have to kind of distribute the load across the thing, is once your memory slots start going, not much of anything you end up buying, having to buy a new device. Yep. The first paper that, that Matt was talking about, part of it was um, was that they weren't properly using the API either. Mm -hmm. and it was up through, it was 2.3 through 4.3. Ah, and 4.4 uh, and 5, um, supposedly they've tightened some of this stuff up. Good. Um, so uh, hopefully they it actually does a better job on the newer devices, but um, but yeah, it's part of part of it was in improperly using the API. It wasn't just that mm -hmm. you know that it didn't didn't catch didn't get all the spots. Although there was some of that too, but um, you know the if you if you're removing um, applications, you need to make sure you're removing all the data that goes with it and that kind of thing as well. Mm -hmm. Yep. And, and you know, uh, despite the flaws, you know, I, there are probably uh, oogles of more cases where the devices just haven't been wiped and that's where information gets lost or, you know, compromised than a case where the wipe wasn't quite perfect. That's true. <laughs> I, I, I don't remember too many cases. Well, I, there, I guess there are cases where data has been recovered from drives. It's usually because of, you know it, most of the recovery cases. And I'm not sure how familiar the audience is with this, but the uh, most of the time when data gets recovered from drives, for ex example, in forensic, it's not because it's been wiped and they're re basically restoring it from you know some remnants that are left in there. Usually, it's because the only thing that's been overwritten is the indexing to the files, right, yeah, file and the file data is still right. there. To it, right. And uh, that's a completely different situation than a case where it doesn't hasn't been just hasn't been wiped perfectly. Right, right. right. absolutely. <laughs> it's it's much easier to it, the the basic delete functions on you know on most uh, computers doesn't actually delete the data. It just right. deletes the pointers that say this is where the data is located. Mm -hmm. And so it's still out there in unallocated space most of the time. Right, absolutely. So I gotta use so, sdelete. sdelete, yep. Yeah, there is an sdelete function. Secure delete, secure yep. delete. to basically uh, make, sure it gets, uh, make sure it gets overwritten. And uh, the, of course the attackers seem to know this. Yes. <laughs> 
<laughs> Are you trying to segue here? <laughs> <laughs> trying, trying to segue here. So, uh, John, I guess the ransomware just keeps on coming. And this. Well, uh, yeah, this was an interesting one because we've talked about ransomware before. We talked about malware before. This is kind of the first time, I, th I mean, we've seen this kind of thing before with regular malware, what I'll call run-of-the-mill kind of, usually crimeware, mm -hmm. banking uh, credentials and things like that. Uh, but for ransomware, I don't think we've seen this before, so this was a little interesting. There's um, a family out there called Tox. It's the Tox Ransomware Toolkit, and they've made it really simple. So somebody has set up a website. Uh, first of all, it's only accessible over Tor, so you got to get your, your, your Tor browser fired up and go to a specific .onion domain where they have a web portal. And you can log in, create a user ID, uh, mm -hmm. get your Bitcoin you know, set up in there, um, and then create an account for yourself, build a virus, and it'll build you know, a custom binary for you. Um, and you can put some pa parameters in there, like how much I want to charge for the ransom. Like it's going to cost you $50 to decrypt all your files, and then maybe some notes as to why you're being targeted, things like that, mm -hmm. and that'll get displayed to the user. Um, but basically it builds it for you, then you get this sample, you have to distribute it yourself, the interesting thing about this is they kind of create the whole portal for you. So it's the management too. So this binary that you're distributing, all the infected bots that you as an attacker might you know, harvest uh, and um, you know, get into your botnet are gonna check into this one portal, again, over Tor. Mm -hmm. So the infected machine, part of that malware on there, it downloads the Tor bundle it uses Tor to go talk out to um, the command and control. So again, some anonymity. anonymity can't it's say it's that hard word. to pronounce, isn't it? It is a hard <laughs> word. Uh, so yeah, they basically made it so it's pretty hard to track it down because uh, Tor in general is pretty hard to figure yeah. out where these devices really are in the network. Um, and uh, I'm trying to think if there are any uh, uh, other interesting things. Well, go ahead. Well, the interesting thing that I saw was that um, the way that these guys monetize it is they take a cut of whatever ransom yes. you get through the portal. Right. So they are effectively making money off this, giving away this free service, which is, you know, it's a smart business move, I suppose. And it also takes some of the heat off of you because, uh, off the, the owners, because they're not, they don't have to worry about distribution. They don't have to worry about certain aspects of the, of the Yeah, story. I guess, you know, and that's one of the things is that if it really truly had been free and it, you, they could argue that they had no part in a crime. They're basically, you know, just like writing malware isn't necessarily a crime, it's using it that's the crime. And so right. they're basically facilitating some. And so ultimately they could make that art, but if they're taking a part of the ransom, mm -hmm. I don't think they could make that argument. I'm, you know, I'm, I'm just, you know, <laughs> right, yeah. I'm just making some observations here. But, you know, ultimately, um, you know, we, we've seen Actually, my personal opinion is I think the, the, the basically the operators, the you know botnet operators, basically invented cloud services. It doesn't surprise me that they're more cloudifying, you know, some of these activities. The uh, you know if we think back, you know, back when we were just basically you know tracking these IRC botnets, they were just caused by worms, and you know they'd start checking in, and they were using them for what denial service attacks and to basically take information just to get information about or use them for storage is like storage is a service you know traffic is a service you know and so proxy networks that, and that was well before we used the cl ter term cloud <laughs> right uh, the just the one fundamental difference is in a real cloud the assets are owned by the cloud operator in a botnet a malicious botnet the assets are owned by somebody else <laughs> by victims yeah <laughs> they're stolen stolen assets, computing assets, storage aspects, assets. And, and to at. kind of carry on with Matt's observation that they take a 20% cut of the Bitcoin, not only that, you don't know whoever's running this little operation, <clears throat> even though they've kind of basically outsourced the mm -hmm. distribution of the malware into all these little variations of, um, you know, same family of malware, but different little samples. They ultimately probably have control of all those bots. So if they wanted to yeah. do something with the bots that you've harvested, you know, you being the bad guy using this portal, um, they've got access to all of those bots. They can do mm -hmm. whatever they want with them, in theory. Not to say I don't know what they're gonna do, but in theory they would as the kind of, you know, oversight of this entire platform. Yeah, um, that's absolutely true. So who knows? That's uh, the, I guess that's the free part of it.
They're yeah. not so free, free part. And of it's it. very apparently. Uh, I think McAfee did this write up, and they said it's uh, it's pretty good as a um, it's pretty evasive of antivirus right now. Mm -hmm. so hopefully, it'll be get better as they because they could probably build a couple of samples and try to make better detections yeah. for it and whatnot. Just so there's no, no mistake here, there is no aspect of this that is a good idea. No, no. <laughs> I mean, for I mean, that's uh, I mean, for for somebody to partake in, that is, uh, I don't think there's any indemnification that that comes from participating in, you know, little pieces and parts of activity like this. You know what? It also reminded me of just now is you know the paper install um, oh, schemes, yeah, yeah. similar to that too. You know, mm -hmm. you have these paper install things where you get kind of a uh, I forget like a facilitator or whatever ID mm -hmm. that is basically your account and then if you can infect somebody when it goes to check in that they installed this piece of malware or whatever other spyware adware junk it checks in and then you get the paper install revenue on it mm -hmm. um, so in a similar kind of thing you go to it they usually have portals you can go into and look and see you know, how well you're doing <laughs> you know as a uh, paper install kind of guy but yeah. it's not something that I would recommend people get, get involved yeah. with Oh, definitely an interesting twist. The, uh, the the attack tools and the the ecosystem around it continues to evolve. Yep. Let's take a look at the uh, internet weather for the last week or so here. Actually, a little less than a week. Yes, we had a, we had a report yeah. on Thursday. Uh, first item here is scan probes on port 47808 TCP. I don't think we've talked about this one before, but obviously this activity is not entirely new. This is actually uh, associated with a uh, protocol called BACnet, and it gets used in uh, automation systems, uh, control systems, for example, HVAC automation. This is a case where you want to be, pay you know, I think the, uh, the target penetration was actually traced yes. back to access through well, an HVAC there, yeah, I've heard that. control system. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it, I mean, this, this is what was reported in the news. We didn't right. have a first-hand knowledge of that, but that uh, was apparently the case. So it, this is another case where devices could potentially be connected, connected to networks and provide a, uh, a means to get through if they're not properly secured, just as we were talking about with the uh, home office routers earlier. In any case, uh, there were actually about three different activities that are taking place on here, and uh, I think the uh, last is probably what kind of raised the um, the attention level here. Uh, first, there there are large spikes that have been going on well beyond to the left of the graph here, that are basically U.S.-based researchers that are doing scanning activity and uh, just looking for vulnerable uh, systems. But it, it, I, I would describe it as uh, innocuous, relatively speaking. Second one, the medium spikes that have basically started around, uh, you know, middle to end of April and become relatively uh, regular there. It's actually coming from a number about, on the order of about 140, 142 source addresses from a provider in Switzerland. I'm inclined to believe that that's research activity as well, but I don't know the origin of that research. The previous one I kind of do. And then the uh, third one, the lower level activity, and you can see it down in the bottom right hand corner pre predominantly, and there's also some background activity taking place here that's relatively low compared to these spikes, uh, is uh, activity that's coming from uh, some sources in China. So uh, a collection of activity here, and uh, what you're looking at is a graph that shows the last 90 days of activity, and like I said, uh, some of this activity sort of uh, uh, increasing more so more recently. Next item here is scan probes on port 23 TCP, that's Telnet, and uh, I'm really, this, we're looking at 60 days of data. We're gonna look at it in terms of the number of source IP addresses later in the, uh, in the report here, but merely wanted to point out that there have been basically a resurgence or a boost in the number of uh, probes on port 23 uh, that uh, basically has uh, raised our level of alertness on that as well. As we've said many times, this is usually brute force password guessing, looking for devices that they can uh, that they can compromise. Usually, small devices that are uh, Internet of Insecure Thing type devices that um, uh, expose that port. In terms of the top 10 most probed ports, uh, port 22 at the top of the list. 
I did take a look at the trend associated with that. There isn't really any significant trend taking place. The, uh, it's only changed one place since last week. Uh, next item, I think uh, John reported on this last week, port 135 TCP. You know, that's kind of been a come and again, go again. Yeah. Uh, port scanning or scanning activity consistently from the same provider. Uh, it's actually, it looks like a US-based cloud provider with addresses registered to China. China, yeah. So uh, it's a little bit of a strange situation there, nevertheless, uh, continuing to scan on that port. Followed it's got by a bad reputation that uh, and yes, there there is the some internet. other reputation information if you were to uh, search that provider. Uh, next item, port twenty three TCP. We just talked about that. Port four forty five TCP, the config is still around, fifty three UDP scanning for uh, DNS servers, four forty three TCP then followed by 1433 Microsoft SQL database, 3389 remote desktop protocol, uh, 1900 UDP, that's SSDP used in uh, reflection attacks, as is DNS often is as well. Well, just taking a little closer look at the probes on port 135 TCP, this is the DC endpoint resolution showing 30 days of activity, as you can see here, a big boost in the activity. As I said earlier, same Chinese registered addresses uh, from a U.S. provider, and it relatively consistently shows uh, source port 4445. I'm not sure why that yeah, particular I made that port is selected, but last it's. Week too. Yeah, you did. Um, I theorized it could be that they might be using ZMAP or um, a possibility. what's that other one? Uh, name's escaping me now, but one of those. Ma oh, mass scan. Yeah, um, there are certainly scanning tools that it's it's easier to just throw them out there and then see who responds right, rather than to actually set up a real session. Right. So it's uh, a matter of efficiency. Uh, in terms of the most sources doing the probing, uh, at the top of the list here, port 23, it's been fairly consistent and we'll take a little closer look at that in a moment, followed by port 445. And then we have uh, some peer-to-peer -peer activity that's showing up there. And then we continue to see 17788. That is continuing to go up. And uh, as we had talked about in other weeks, it appears to be a bit torn activity. And uh, there is, a, I'll say, a loose connection with the potential that it's um, you know, sort of pirated uh, video content being uh, basically uh, made available to uh, Chinese. So in terms of its scan sources on port 23 TCP, uh, as you can see here, I put sort of a reference on the line on there just to give you an idea. We're looking at 90 days of activity, and you can see that the number of sources has kicked up significantly. This is typically, you know, a botnet. What is a little different here is we typically see, like if you look up back here near the end of March, we usually see this sort of bump up and then sort of this tail off. It is a command given to a botnet, and then it, and then it tails off. But more recently, we're seeing these slower sort of climbs, and uh, I don't have a clear explanation for that. Perhaps uh, a botnet's been segmented, or perhaps there's some sort of a propagation that takes place. It's not clear. Uh, you might also see that if it's uh, the command and control is P2P, because it might take some time for the commands to propagate around. I'm only speculating on those points, but uh, it is a little bit different than we had seen in the past. That's our show for today. Thank you for joining us. If you'd like to get in touch with us, you can email us at threattrack at list.att.com, and you can find AT&T Threat Track at the AT&T Tech Channel. We're on YouTube as well as on iTunes. Follow us on Twitter. Our handle is at ATT Security. I'd like to thank you, John. Yep. Thank you, Matt. And thank you, Jim. I'm Brian Rexrode. We'll be back next week with a new episode, and until then, keep your network safe.